next session is on acute promyelocytic leukemia by uh, none other than dr vikram matthews so i uh, welcome uh, dr neeraj siddha to introduce the speaker and the panelists to take ahead with the session thank you sir. thank you very much shendra for uh, first of all for organizing this uh, wonderful scientific session and also for the invitation extended to me uh, it is, today's uh, next session is uh, on acute promyelocytic uh, leukemia and uh, the speaker is uh, professor dr vikram matthews uh, he is a professor of uh, hematology at uh, christian uh, medical college uh, velour uh, dr matthews has been a physician scientist uh, uh, who is pioneered and involved in research and management of uh, uh, patients with acute uh, leukemias uh, for the last two decades um if somebody uh, asked me about uh, uh, what is bench to bedside uh, i uh, you know i would refer them to look at uh, the biography of professor uh, matthews uh, you know sir has extensively conducted uh, you know studies both pre preclinical and right up to the multi center clinical trial to answer a burning question in the subject and more so in acute myeloid leukemia and he has done path breaking work in acute promyelocytic uh, leukemia so he has uh, published extensively in particularly in high impact factor uh, journals as a mentee i am forever indebted to you for introducing me to the world of uh, scientific thinking and aggressive management of leukemias and i consider it my honor to introduce you uh, to this audience sir next uh, i would also go ahead and introduce the panelists of the, this uh, uh, talk and we have dr deepak charles who is a senior consultant in department of uh, hematology and dmt in astra medicity kochi dr sriraj who is a senior consultant in the department of hematology at amla institute of medical sciences thrissur and dr vishwadeep who is a senior consultant in hematology in okhad hospital bangalore with this i uh, pass on to uh, dr vikram sir sir thank you so much neeraj uh, very generous introduction and thank you so much shinto nice to see you after a long time thank you for inviting me for this uh, uh, very impressive uh, uh, meeting that you have organized okay so for the next uh, little over half an hour i'm going to talk about uh, uh, a little bit about our bench to bench side as uh, deeraj uh, uh, introduced to the talk and i'm going to talk about apml it's a topic that most of you all are familiar with and i hope i'm clear and audible uh uh neeraj would i'm clear and audible to you yes sir okay yes sir okay so i'm going to start with uh, something that i always start with and i kind of highlight you know we have challenges in treating myeloid malignancies in india and this pictures have nothing to do with myeloid malignancies they lymphoid they actually uh lymphoid malignancy is a very advanced stage it's easy to recognize that when you have a solid tumor in a liquid malignancy it's more difficult to say advanced you know they come to us much later after multiple opinions with infections so to expect and anticipate that our results are going to be exactly like those published in clinical studies in the west is not uh, very rational to to expect that we have significant financial and social constraints this is work uh, that was done from our center a lot of work put in by chepsi in this and basically most of you all are familiar with this i'm not going to berate the point that treatment is expensive and challenging and often treatment is expensive in myeloid leukemias in general is not because of the cost of the individual drugs it's because of the significant off target side effects resulting in the need for significant supportive care so once they develop an infection fungal infections go to icu the cost really explodes onto us and it's not easy to take patients through uh these kind of diseases so really cost of therapy accurate and early diagnosis targeted therapy with minimal target side effects rational evidence driven effective supportive care with regionally relevant data so you can take the aml 15 trial and say flagida flagida is a standard induction in aml a uh, very high level of evidence and it will totally not uh, apply to us so we really need regionally relevant uh, data so if you look at all these points uh, there is all this to some extent has been addressed in acute promyelocytic leukemia in india so apml coming to apml itself again for a very focused audience all of you are aware 
the subtype of AML, very distinctive uh, features, both clinical and laboratory, and characterized for the most part by a reciprocal translocation to the chromosome 15 and 17, leading to an oncoprotein called PMLRAR. There are three isoforms of it. And there are, that's more than 95%, this is the translocation. There are 11 other variants, and often students are, you know, bent on kind of mugging up 11 other variants. Don't do that. I think it's more important to be aware of what is standard and common and manage. And, you know, smart people know where to go look for data when required. So if you go look into this journal on PLN guidelines, the list of those rare variants, there are more publications than patients with those variants. And whether they are sensitive to ATO or ATRA is there. And you can always look it up. And so when, when you suspect it, you can always look for those particular mutations. The spectrum of isoforms within PFLRAR alpha, from what we can see from a fairly large data set at our center, is very similar to what has been reported in the West. So even prior to the introduction of uh, ATRA, it's important to recognize that the survival curves were excellent with conventional ATRA with chemotherapy. And this is a series of studies that were done by the Petima Group and the European APL Group. So again, the importance of doing systematic studies to address simple questions like, should ATRA precede chemotherapy? Should ATRA be given with chemotherapy? So all those questions were, sim uh, were, were systematically addressed. And you know, that's how the ATRA plus chemotherapy regimen came up. There was a risk stratification that was developed. But it's very important to recognize in these clinical, in the setting of clinical trials, there was very little early mortality as you can see by these survival curves. This will look very different if you were to truly enroll every single patient in your center and look at this. You know, there'll be a fairly rapid drop over here. And that was recognized in many uh, uh, registry-based data where they showed that outside the setting of a clinical trial, in fact, the early deaths in Sweden where there is no you know, restriction to access to medical care, everybody has good access to medical care. But outside the clinical trial setting, the early death in that era, atria chemotherapy was as high as 30%. And in fact, there was a study that was subsequently published in 2014 in leukemia, where they looked at patients in France, those who were enrolled on clinical trials and those who could not get enrolled on those same European APL trials, which I showed you the curve, survival curve earlier. And they showed that the early death rates was 21% in those who are not enrolled in clinical trials versus 3%. So it's kind of important because there's a tendency in India to want to kind of replicate data that is there in clinical trials. And uh, that may not be the wisest thing to do because unless you know and recognize our own problems, there's no way that we're going to improve. So it's also important to remove, uh, remember that uh, with anthracycline, there's exacerbation of coagulopathy, but the same effect happens with ATRA as well. And this is a, a paper that, you know, in which I had the opt privilege to write a commentary. And just to illustrate the concept of ketosis, when you do have ketosis, basically what happens is the nuclear membrane first ruptures, unlike in apoptosis where there's a shrinking, and then the chromosomes intermingle, the chromatin intermingles with the cytoplasm, and a lot of very sticky histones, etc., are very sticky. They take on many of the proteases, etc., which stick to them. And then when finally, when the cell membrane ruptures, it's almost like a net that is thrown out by the cell, which is very sticky and adheres to the, to the endothelial cells, causes further exacerbation of coagulopathy, leaky capillaries, contributing to some extent to what you see, this unusual phenomenon of IC bleeds, et cetera, with what would be considered normal coagulation parameters in any other disease, meaning platelets above 50,000, normal PT, APDT, fibrogenogenia, normal, et cetera. Uh, and also probably contributes to differentiation syndrome. So uh, the world has, of course, moved on. And all of you all are familiar with this phenomenal work by uh, Lokoko and his team at the uh, SAL uh, study group, the German and the SAL study group, which established in low and intermediate risk the combination of just ATRA and arsenic trioxide. This is a phase three prospective trial. And a little complicated regimen in the sense they had this ATRA 15 days on, 15 days off, and there's a fair amount of rational to that, but I'll tell you why we think we should challenge all this. Because from a caregiver and a patient perspective, sometimes it's not easy to remember all these dates. But in short, when they compared it with ATRA plus chemotherapy, the survival was far superior, and that is now the standard of care. And with this new standard of care, low and intermediate risk at least, even in registry data from Europe, 
the induction mortality has significantly reduced and the relapse rates more strikingly have significantly reduced. So this data is all out there in the public domain. In the high-risk patients, there is an ongoing study looking at, uh, at ATO plus ATRA, but the best available data is this phase two data from APL4, APML4 by the Australian group, which looks at ATRA, ATO. And I want to stress, I forgot to stress one thing. There was absolutely no maintenance in the ATO plus ATRA uh, with, the, uh, with the SAL study, which established ATO plus ATRA. So in the study by the APML4, they did retain the 6MP methotrexate for two years, but the induction and consolidation was ATO plus ATRA with anthracycline re uh, retained mainly in the induction. And the survival curves were excellent, including in the high-risk group of patients. So it's important that if you're following a protocol, it's important to follow a protocol rather than keep innovating on every aspect because it's very difficult to say which, as, which part of a protocol, you can't combine a protocol A, part A, and then part B from another protocol. So you might as well follow a protocol. That's my general advice to students, unless you're leading and doing some studies on your own. So with that, we'll move to ATO and our experience. Arsenic trioxide has a very colorful history. It's the drug that's been on the pharmacopoeia for the longest period of time, more than 2000 years. Uh, way back in, uh, in 14th century, Paracelsus had made this important statement. All substances are poisons, the right dose differentiates a poison from a remedy. So in the early days when, in the, I'm talking about the early, uh, late 90s, when we started using ATO, there was this ooh, ah, about, you know, it's a toxin, it's gonna cause secondary cancer. Uh, I would argue that anthracycline is equally toxic. And if you give one milligram of arsenic every day uh, for five years, everybody will get cancer. So a lot of the data on toxicity in ATO in those days came from environmental toxicity data, which is very different from therapeutic arsenic uh, data. And we've done a fair amount of pharmacopantic work in our JCO paper, if you can look at hair, nail levels over long periods of time, et cetera, which actually is below even, even it's comparable to normal controls. Anyway, it has been used for CML for a period of time. And today, organic arsenicals outside of APML have really established themselves only in the treatment of trypnosomiasis. And even there, there are better drugs these days. So how does arsenic trioxide, why is it so specific? So if you use a higher dose of arsenic, any cell will die. In, any cancer cell will die, but at the cost of the organism itself, that means you'll end up with significant off-target side effects and significant toxicity. But in APML, at very low doses, therapeutic doses, ATO binds to the PML domain of the oncoprotein PML area, causes polyubiquitination, and this protein is then degraded by the proteasome. And when that's degraded, the wild-type PML, remember, is, all, is also there. And due to a dominant negative effect, the wild-type PML is not effective. The PML is very important for bringing about normal apoptosis. So the RAR is, the normal RAR is important for classical differentiation. So there's an excessive repressive effect. When you degrade, that repressive effect is gone. Normal apoptosis happens. And you get the creation of the nuclear bodies. So... In a, when you have this PML area, and if you stain for PML, you get this very microspeckle pattern. When you degrade PML and you have wild type PML, they tend to aggregate. And this aggregate is actually a combination of almost 50 proteins. And this protein complex is very important for normal apoptosis. So I'll start uh, with our early experience in our evolution. Uh, when I uh, joined actually for my, into joined hematology, not even uh, as a res resident, uh, before the DM course actually started in 2000, uh, in 1999, uh, we had patients who would relapse after what was then considered standard of care, which was either just chemotherapy or ATRA, which was difficult to get. And we would have patients who were sent off on palliation, who would return to us six months later uh, after visiting this gentleman in Dehradun, who had looked absolutely well. And we soon recognized that arsenic trioxide was used in the preparation that was administered and the APML patients seemed to do very well with that. And that's how in 1998, we actually developed this in-house protocol. I'm not going to go into the details on how we decided on these schedules. There was a fair amount of pharmacokinetic data which is available. There was no standard phase one kind of data to define the upper limit of the dose. And we stuck with the dose that the Chinese have used and the world has continued to use. That is the upper limit of 10 milligrams. 
Uh, we initially manufactured it in-house in and subsequently had to move it for legal issues to Intas Pharmaceuticals, and that's how we still continue to get the product. So Sister Teresema, forever grateful to her. She was the one who actually prepared the arsenic trioxide in the earliest early days. You know, actually, it's a very simple uh, formulation. You just need alkalization and heat to solubilize, and then we used to accelerate the uh, degenerative studies and endotoxin studies and release it for patient use. And it worked as well as anything. So when you hear of pharmaceutical companies telling you formulation is very important, a lot of rubbish really when it comes to arsenic trioxide. Arsenic trioxide was as cheap as salt. You know, it used to cost us uh, 10 rupees to 20 rupees to prepare a 10 milligram wire. And today it costs $400 in the US and paradoxically it's the most expensive therapy in the Western world. And that's Sudhir Kumar with permission, the first patient who received arsenic trioxide 20th January, 1998, a young boy farmer's son who did not have resource for conventional therapy, 80% of the patients with ATML in those days be sent away because they really could not afford the therapy. He is well, he is married, has three children, and uh, he, is, he is doing very well, almost 20, 20 plus years ago. And this is the first data that we published, gained a fair amount of traction and really moved arsenic trioxide from relapsed data to frontline therapy. And we subsequently did a fair amount of work on trying to predict with single agent arsenic trioxide. Remember with single agent arsenic trioxide, because the cost of the therapy was so low, we could actually treat every single patient uh, in contrast to conventional ATO plus, uh, chemo, uh, ATRA plus chemotherapy regimen. So it has to be put in context. And in those days we were infusing patients, you know, there were children sitting like this. Uh, remember today it seems, it seems normal, but those days there was a lot of outcry about cardiac toxicity, sudden deaths, and that's the story in itself and why that really the whole QTC interval at prolongation is more a function of tachycardia and acute sickness than ATO per se. But provided you keep the potassium and magnesium under good control, for the most part, unless there's a predisposing cardiac, you really don't need any cardiac monitoring uh, during administration. There's a lot of concern with second malignancies, mainly data coming from environmental toxicity. And this is actually uh, epithelial hyperkeratosis was seen in one of the patients treated by Valandro Vaidyo. Remember, he used to start this treatment, but unfortunately, there was no stopping it. They just kept on taking it for years and years together. And they ended up with this kind of hyperkeratosis, and one of them actually dealt with this famous epithelial carcinoma and died. In our own series, which we updated, there's no second malignancy report that could be attributed to currently used ATO regimens. I'm not going to go through a whole lot of data that we generated, including how cytopedia and how the counts recover with the arsenic trioxide, the short and long-term side effects, the hepatotoxicity profile, the relationship with certain uh, genotypes and toxicity. We also went on to show that FIT3 ITD for the first time way back in, yeah, in 2007, you know, there's a lot of data now saying arsenic trioxide, but we, we reported way back then that FIT3 ITD, which is seen in 50% of patients with APML, does not impact the outcome if you use ATO. In fact, there's now data to say that ATO can actually degrade with the ITD just like it does PMLRIA. Uh, as I said, no second malignancy state fertility was well preserved, and the most important thing was cost was significantly reduced. A formal analysis on cost effectiveness was done with generic arsenic trioxide. Remember, if you look at cost uh, effective ana analysis in many Western data, uh, it is actually comparable, if not more expensive, because the arsenic trioxide is so expensive in Europe and North America. So as I said, $400 to $600 per 10 milligram wire, which is really criminal if you come to think of it. Anyway, so we use generic arsenic trioxide and most of us get it for anything between 200 to 400 rupees per 10 milligram. So this work is really credit to Aniket Bunker, who actually studied economics to some extent, to actually put this entire data together. A lot of effort by him. He's now in Canada and doing very well. Uh, did a detailed micro-costing and a bottom-up costing methodology of all our treatment protocols, factored in every single element that goes into it, and used a Markov modeling for relapse, to factor in relapse and death, compared that with a standard therapy that we would have used. And since we were not using conventional chemotherapy, we compared the cost with uh, conventional chemotherapy that was used for AML. So that's a little bit of a uh, downside. It would have been good to have APML patients treated with chemotherapy. But I think all of you all recognize the costing would have been similar with the conventional chemotherapy and the cytopenia that we get. 
Uh, and that's the kind of cost we got for a newly diagnosed patient. It's in dollars because it's national publication, but you can work it out. Uh, was eight thousand five hundred. This is uh, this is lifetime cost. It's not uh, just a one year cost. So you're looking at follow up, including accounting for relapse, etc. Uh, and the chemotherapy it was twenty four thousand three hundred dollars. So uh, it truly is the most cost effective regimen and can be internationally applied to any economy. And we are able to treat 100% of our patients who do come to us. So the next question that we asked is, we do see some patients who relapse. And we had an opportunity in the sense that we were using state clinic diagnostic drugs and before you know, the whole ATO ATRA story came along. And we wanted to study why they do relapse. So the conventional story about relapse in AML is, in leukemia in general, is clonal evolution or a leukemic stem cell. So clonal evolution is conventional Darwinian evolution of mutations that develop resistance and leukemic stem cells. So for the most part in APML, there is no leukemic stem cell component that has been truly defined. And as you know, it comes on in ontogeny at a slightly later stage in the conventional hematopoietic stem cell. As far as clonal evolution, there was a lot of attention to some mutations in the PML B2 domain where ATO binds the A2163 mutation. But in reality, those were so rare that uh, it could not explain the majority of mutations that we saw. In fact, we had a detailed publication, I encourage you to read this paper in PLUS One by Ariel Arce, who really started off the work uh, in my lab with uh, APML. And we did, a, we did a comprehensive mutation analysis of primary and relapsed APML. This is an international collaborative work led by our group and from uh, the University of Singapore, National University of Singapore by Koffler and his group where we looked at sequencing. I'm not going to show the data, but just to say that we did find some new mutations, but for the most part, we could not define a mutation that defined primary resistance to arsenic trioxide. And even secondary mutations that could cause arsenic trioxide resistance per se was extremely rare and could not explain the majority of lapses. And for people who have used ATO, we know that when you do ATO in relapsed patients and you don't follow it up with a transplant, the survival terms are not very good with just an ATO and atrium metrally. So that was our starting template and the questions that we asked. Why was this? Of course, I'm very grateful to welcome Trust DBT in the Ireland for the 2012 and subsequent 2018 funding, which funded most of the work that you're going to subsequently see. So we came across a phenomena where we did an in vitro work, and I'm just going to take you through one bar to illustrate the effect. If I take NB4 cells, the cell, APML cell line, and I look at ATO at two micromolar, I get a certain kill. But if I were to co-culture those cells with a stromal cell line, there was the kill was not so significant. So there's somehow the stromal cells were giving a protective effect to the APML cells. And you know, there's a whole lot of controls which I'm not going to go. So all the con, con you know, whether it's just a non-specific effect, the dilution effect, all those controls were addressed, and all these publications are available as open access. Uh, and what we did find is that in co-culture, there was a significant change in the gene expression profile of the NB4 cells. There was increase in the NF-kappa-B and increased co-ligulation of NF-kappa-B, the canonical pathway, the P65 of the NF-kappa-B into the nucleus. And this actually drove a lot of the survival. So if you take the same APML cell, cell individually and exposed to IATO, there was a certain kill. But if you grew it with the same cell with stroma, there was a protective effect. So somehow the stroma was signaling in the microenvironment to protect the cell. We validated this effect in a 3D scaffold model. Very grateful to Inserm Christine Shomin and her team for establishing these models in our center. And of course, a lot of work done by Sarnan on how to target this effect. So we were very keen to see how could we overcome this kind of effect that we were seeing of the microenvironment which in the newly diagnosed and relapsed patients when we compared was more prominent in the relapsed patients than in the uh, newly diagnosed patients. And uh, this is where some of the work came. We further integrated it. And, and this work with the MIR23A5P further enhanced, further uh, reinforces the impact of nf kappa -B because nf kappa -B is really upstream of MIR23A5P, which further act activates protective autophagy in AML. But the bottom line was we screened for a set of inhibitors. I'm going to skip all these agents that was a fair amount of background to why we screened those. I'm going to concentrate on the protism inhibitors. So with ATO, you had a kill. With stromal co-culture, that protective effect was there. But when you 
use bortezomib, which was an FDA approved agent, you were able to restore the sensitivity even with co-culture. That basically was the story. And so we are looking at both uh, NP4 cell lines and we replicated the data with primary cells from patients with APM, showing that the kill that you see, that the protective effect you see with stroma can be lost when you use pharmacologically relevant concentrations of bortezomib. Restores the sensitivity of malignant chromolysides to arsenic trioxide. Uh, and we also showed the mechanism was by an increase in the unfolded protein response, increased reactive oxidation, and decreased mitochondrial membrane potential and activation of caspases. And none of this is novel because most of this is known as, an, as the mechanisms of activity of bortezomib. But we were the first to demonstrate the additive effect of ATO and bortezomib on all these phenomena in bringing about cell death. Now, if you remember that first slide that showed you how APML works, there was a problem. And the problem was that the conventional dogma of the time was that you should never use a proteasome inhibitor with ATO because an intact proteasome is, is, is very important for ATO to work and degrade the PML area, if you remember that first slide. So now here we were using bortezomib. So the question is, what would happen to this PMLR degradation? When we looked at the microspeckling uh, pattern, we found that ATO plus bortezomib restored the speckled pattern as well as ATO alone. And therefore, this, this is an indirect evidence that the PML RAR is actually being degraded and the wild type PML effect is coming along. So in fact, in this publication, we went on to demonstrate a pure basic science paper looking at how it induces a different mechanism of protein degradation that is autophagy and the additive effect of combining ATO with bortezomib, which is a P62 protein, carrier protein based degradation of PML RAR. And there's a lot of Western blots that actually go to show this effect, uh, which again, you can refer to the poster. And we went on to show in our animal model work done by Anso, who is back there in Kerala, probably close to you, and Sachin, who's also there in Amrita. Uh, they were all instrumental, and uh, students over the years have contributed significantly to this body of work where we actually showed the synergy between ATO and bortezomib, uh, not just in in vitro model, but in a in vivo model, uh, and showed a survival advantage. And this was taken forward in a phase two study at our center, looking at bortezomib with relapsed APL, and compared to historical controls. But I want to stress that the study is not designed to show efficacy. It was designed essentially to study safety. And we can say with fair amount of, uh, uh, fa fa fairly confidently that ATO combined with bortezomib, the details of the regimen are there in this publication, was fairly safe. And there was a signal to suggest an improvement efficacy. And we hope through HCC to take this to a larger phase two multi-center study. And we are working on that. So this kind of summarizes a lot of work showing how ETO bortezomib, there's a synergistic, there's a protective effect mediated by the microenvironment. And that is overcome when you use bortezomib because it brings about uh, uh, increased, uh, it inhibits NF-kappa-B and then alters the, the drug resistance and how this entire thing put together. All of this is summarized in the paper, but the combination is effective. And the most important thing is the clinical trial also showed the uh, safety and that we hope to expand it to a further phase two study. Now, the previous work that I had showed you established the importance of the microenvironment, the dominant pathway that could potentially be targeted for therapy, and which we have shown in an animal model and early phase two study that could be targeted. Now, we wanted to further implicate the mechanism of such resistance to ATO in APL and AML. So, ATO has really changed the therapy in, in, in APL. And what we really want to work as our group is to see whether we can get the equivalent of this effect in AML. And the preliminary work that we, which we went on, this is just recently published. Again, it's an open access uh, publication. So should all of you could get the details of it. I'm not going to go through those details, but I'm just kind of give you the thought of what where, where we are going. We're trying to further understand why some cell, cell lines are resistance to APML. Why is AML resistance to, 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 to APO? And is there a way that Non M3 APL can be made sensitive to ATO. So, the key points uh, is metabolic rewiring promotes ATO resistance in APL independent of PML mutation. So, whether you have that A216B mutation or not, inhibition of mitochondrial respiration combined with ATO is a potential therapeutic option for relapsed APL and non M3 APL. So, we generated an ATO resistance cell line, it's called NB4EV 
asking Troxel residents one, there are three versions of that. And DB stands for LLC in my name, we are, who uh, LLC you know, started this work in generating the cell line. Now the EVSR1 has the A216 mutation. We were fortunate to have another cell line from UF1, uh, which is not known, but we documented that it's actually A2 resistant, but does not have the A2, A216 mutation. So this was useful for us to look at mutation plus mutation negative. And we also compare that effect with ATO sensitive parent cell line NB4 and ATO resistant AML cell. All these AML cell lines and primary AML cells at the doses that we use for APL are resistance to arsenic trioxide. We demonstrated that arsenic trioxide acts as a glycolytic inhibitor. In fact, if you look at the literature, you will find this data that ATO actually inhibits exokinase. And in fact, in APML in NB4, you can interchange two deoxyglucose and get the same effect as ATO. Now, ATO sensitive cells like APML and NB4 cell, which is an APML cell line, is strictly follows the Warburg hypothesis. Uh, so this is a lot of information I'm summarizing here. The Warburg hypothesis essentially is that most of cancer cells preferentially use the glycolytic pathway and don't use the oxphos or the mitochondrial pathway. And that's a long story. And are dependent on it. And in fact, when you block the glycolytic pathway, they actually die. While ATO resistant cells can adapt and use the oxphos pathway, and it's also increasingly recognized that conventional AML does not follow the Warburg hypothesis, especially the stem cell compartment of the non-M3 APL, AML. So this cartoon summarizes it. I encourage you to read this paper that has fairly recently published. This takes a conventional ATO sensitive APL cell. When you use ATO, it degrades the PML area. It inhibits glycolysis, which nobody talks about, but which we have demonstrated. There is very little ability for the cell to use, met, uh, to use the oxfos pathway, and this together degrades and results in apoptosis. But when you develop an A2160 mutation, and those that are not, you, you can't degrade the MLR, so the oncoprotein is not degraded. But if you in, also, when you inhibit the ATO in, in other, other, other resistant patients and, when you, and in cell lines that don't have this mutation as well, the resistant cell line has a higher metabolic plasticity and can switch metabolism to predominant oxfos and survive. But if you do block oxfos by FCCP, which is a non-specific inhibitor, uh, then you can actually overcome and a combination of ATO plus uh, a mitocan, which is a mitochondrial inhibitor, can bring about apoptosis. So that's something that we are looking, demonstrating the potential of combining ATO with a mitocan in ATO resistance, not only in APL, but also in non m AML. Please watch the space carefully. We are closing in on some agents and we should have the next set of data on what we plan for AML as well out fairly soon. Now, coming to the management of relapsed AML, this APML, this is something that we fairly recently published. Again, work done a lot, started by Rubal Sharma, uh, along with Fauzia. And basically, I'm not going to go through this in detail. Basically, we said patients who had relapsed after treating with ATO could be treated with ATO, ATRA, and atracycline again. And there was a very high chance that they would achieve molecular remission. However, if you did not use an autologous stem cell transplant, which unfortunately some patients in our centers cannot afford, the outcomes are not so good. But with an autologous stem cell transplant, with, after achieving MRD negative, the outcomes were excellent. In, 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 in all age groups. Now, I want you to, this challenges the ELN, ELN 2019 in which I am also an author because at that time there was really no randomized control and it's unlikely a randomized control trial is going to be done. But the recommendation there is patients relapsing after ATRA plus ATO should be managed with ATRA plus chemotherapy. And our data set certainly challenges that. We would not recommend that. We would still use an ATO. In fact, we feel the bulk population for the most part is still sensitive to ATO. There's a small component that undergoes this entire microenvironment protective effect, and that can, be all, that can be overcome when you achieve MRD negative and take them for an autologous stem cell transplantation. So this latest publication of ours, again, is just out, and I encourage you to go to it's an open access journal, and I encourage you to look at all the supplementary, which has the details of our protocol. A lot of work done by uh, they and our team to put uh, this data, which is this data set, which has been going on for a long time. Basically, we are using ATO and ATRA, uh, and our protocols are low, intermediate, and high risk. Some differences are ATO and ATRA is used alone for the low risk. For the intermediate, we do add two doses of anthracycline only in induction. 
And the concept is that we want to reduce the risk of hyperleukocytosis and differentiation syndrome, which in our setup can be associated with morbidity, moving to ICU and significant increased costs. And it has worked well for us. For the high-risk patients, we use anthracyclines both in induction and consolidation one. ATO and ATRA are always administered concurrently, unlike the sal jam protocol. And if you go through this paper, I don't have time for this, but I've given the rationale for that and why we do it like that. It's a lot easier for patients and caregivers to administer it the way we do it. This protocol is going to undergo some modifications as part of an anticipated phase three study that we're going to do in multi-center under the ban for HCC shortly. And I really encourage all of you all to, if you all don't know about HCC, to register your center or as individuals and be an active member of that group. Uh, very briefly, the protocol looks like this. Again, I encourage you to read the paper because it has all the details. It's very reproducible in any center in India, uh, fairly standard uh, protocol, including all the supportive care is there in the protocol. But basically, ATO ATRA alone is low risk. In uh, intermediate risk, there's two doses of mitosantrol. We use mitosantrol basically because it's the least expensive, and we don't think there's any difference between any of the other anthracyclines. Uh, and uh, might present from at least in the AML data, and we don't see why that should be different to APML. Uh, and we use two in induction, induction and consolidation use uh, anthracycline in addition to ATO ATRA. The other curious thing that we do slightly different is we bring the ATRA on for the intermediate and low risk only after seven days of ATO and anthracycline, and or after the WB or with the WBC count is less than 5,000. Uh, again, it's difficult for me to to exp uh, you know to give a detailed exponential uh, uh, explanation for that rational. I try to address that in the paper, but the survival curves, as you can see, were excellent in the patient on per protocol analysis. Of course, we have a group of patients who come in very sick with we've excluded in some of the analysis, but every single patient that is that is included from 2015 is accounted in that paper, and the details are there. Uh, you see that there's a complete loss of the of the relevance of the risk stratification and the high risk does as well as the low and intermediate risk. So I would say, if you look at our challenges with APML, yes, we've got a cost-effective therapy, we've got accurate diagnosis, we've got target therapy, we've rationed and evidence to an effective supportive care and risk stratified therapy, uh, including IMRD driven strategy, which I've not talked about a lot, uh, but most of our data covers that. And we have regionally relevant data-driven strategy to address local challenges. So it's not like uh, flag header, flag header, RCT, phase three, we're going to use an AML. Certainly we are not going to use it. We are using strategies that we validated in our setup and we can use it and we are confident can be replicated in any center in the country. And we hope to do a multi-center study to take this forward. So I think for our country, uh, you know, a lot of this new drug, CAR T cell, yes, they have their role and we should continue to work on them. But there's a big, big, big role for increasing basic science work and clinical trials for drug repositioning and repurposing. Almost every pathway has targeted by conventional agents that are available. Optimizing dose and schedules is very important. We really need a platform for data collection and collaboration, both within clinical centers and scientists. Uh, it's very important. And that's where the HCC Center comes. It's an older slide. We have about 21 centers. We collaborate. That's our vision statement. We are very proud of our vision statement and our logo. The logo represents a uh, country, uh, the colors of our flag, and uh, the figurine in that is uh, open arms welcoming everybody to come and join the Hepatology Cancer Consortium. The Hepatology Cancer Consortium is intended to be a multi-center collaborative academy organization to improve knowledge, standardize cost-effective treatment strategy, and promote regionally relevant research in hematological cancers. So uh, this is work that we uh, we have published some work with ALL and we recently published our COVID work. There's two large retrospective studies that are now going, led by Subir and Shepsi, and we hope to get some multi-center studies as well going forward. I'll stop with acknowledgement, thanking all the patients, young and small, who have been part of this uh, incredible journey over the last two decades. And a wonderful bunch of students, uh, they all look very happy, but they all work very hard. Uh, who have contributed various aspects to the work that has that I've uh, had the privilege to show to you today. And of course, collaborators both in the country and outside the country who were instrumental in taking this forward, uh, colleagues within the department and outside the department. Thank you for your attention. Happy to take questions. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, sir, uh, for that uh, 
extensive uh, uh, coverage of the topic and the uh, you know congratulations on uh, the uh, work that you're doing and your team is doing fantastic um, uh, may i now open uh, the talk for uh, uh, discussion uh, sir um uh, can i start with a few questions yeah, um, uh, first yeah. is uh, um, uh, why is uh, i mean so you mentioned arsenic is uh, not specific to although it degrades pml it's not specific to uh, pml probably so uh, uh, you know so the, what are the uh, uh, you know if, if it's not specific to pml and it also degrades flt3 also. sorry so i, I think uh, i said uh, what i what i meant was Compared to many cancers, arsenic trioxide are non-specific cellular toxin. So if you give enough of it, you'll kill any cell. But at a very low dose, it's fairly specific for, fairly specific for PML area. But it's not the only protein that it binds to. It binds to any protein which is rich in cysteine residues. Uh, and that's a well-known fact. But in APML, somehow that oncoprotein is so, the, the malignancy is so dependent on that single oncoprotein which it binds to. Uh, while in FLIP3 ITD, for example, it is possible that just inhibiting the FLIP3 ITD is not going to get rid of the malignancy. You know, there are multiple drivers. FLIP3 ITD is a secondary player, uh, often drives the proliferation and the poor prognosis, but is not the primary leukemogenic effect, uh, a driver for the most part. And most cancers, uh, with the exception of CML and maybe APML, very rarely do you have this very single point driver that can that can be inhibited and completely switch the malignancy off. That, that's actually a rarity. So maybe that is why ATO is reasonably specific for APML. And if it were to be used in other malignancies, I'm sure the data will evolve and we ourselves are working on it. It will not be as a single agent. Got it. Got it. Thank you. And what is the reason for the synergy between uh, arsenic and ATRA, which you mentioned you, I mean, you, you, uh, briefly during your presentation? So uh, it's actually, they act on two different parts of the protein of the PML area, and they bring about kind of similar effects. So it's, it's, a, it's not a direct synergy. The ATO acts on the, on the if you look at the PML area structure, the oncoprotein, the, the ATO binds the PML B2 domain and brings about its degradation. ATRA, on the other hand, uh, it acts actually on the RAR part. Normally, I usually have a cartoon which I use to teach students, you know, when you have Physiological, when you have normal RAR, physiological dose of retinoic acid bind to it and releases the whole lot of repressor molecules that are bound to the retinoic acid receptor. And that further binds to various parts of the chromatin and brings about a, a, a general a repression of gene expression. When you have physiological concentrations in different genes, this, uh, the core repressor complexes are released and downstream transcription can happen. When you have PML RAR, there is a disproportionately strong binding of these repressor molecules to the PML RAR molecule. But if you use pharmacological doses of, uh, of uh, uh, ATRA, of vitamin A or retinoic acid, you can overcome that repression. Now, when you use ATO and ATRA, both phenomena, one is the degradation of the PML RAR, therefore, the ATRA is going to work probably even better because it's going to work as well on the wild type RAR as well, right? And it's also going to work in the PML. And so the, the oncoprotein itself is going to be degraded and the PML and the ATRA is going to bring about a better differentiation because there's less uh, PML RAR at all. One more thing, so do you think this botizomib uh, could be uh, used for a high risk upfront uh, 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 and I, replace the chemotherapy? I, I, I really think uh, APML will be a disease that will go to the outpatient treatment with uh, oral ATO, oral ATRA, and probably a oral proteasome in a bit. I invite questions from the panelists, Dr. Deepak, Dr. Sriraj, and Shruti. Um, thank you, sir, for that very insightful talk. Uh, so I just want a, a basic question on the strategy. Uh, um, uh, uh, some patients who, uh, Your audio, audio is breaking. Yeah, there could be some patients uh, uh, who come to us uh, being uh, referred from other centers. So, uh, and if you go through the labs, maybe we, we, we see you know, a couple of patients who started with a baseline count of uh, 2,000, 3,000 WBC count. 
without any treatments, once they come to us, that their cotton counts can be in the 15,000 to 16,000 range. So where do you place these patients in the risk stratification as to begin with as a low risk or, or with the counts if they come to us? Uh, good question. So for the longest time, the question was, is, is APML risk group a function of time? Okay. And I didn't show you that data. We've analyzed it in detail. And I can tell you confidently, it's not a function of time. So what you're explaining, what you're telling me is an unusual case. But usually we risk stratify at the time we start treatment. You know, and for and if you look at it, it's very paradoxical. The longer the patient's duration of symptom, the more likely he's going to be low risk in our analysis than a high risk patient. Okay, so that WBC high count that you're seeing on the periphery is actually a function of how the microenvironment is retaining the malignant cells. It's not a function of tumor burden. I, I don't know if you're getting me. Yes, so for some reason, the malignant cells are held much more strongly in the microenvironment because if you do these marrows in the low risk or the high risk, the marrow is packed out. Okay, but okay. somehow the high risk patients, the ability for the malignant cells to come out into the into the circulation is more. And remember, our data will tell you based on the microenvironment, those circulating cells are probably going to be are, 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 are going to be a challenge, you know, because they are they they may they may die, but the microenvironment packed cells are not going to die so easily. So we and so my understanding is we take them as high risk and go ahead. Yes, at your, your specific case, the time you started treatment is what we would recommend that you start that you assign risk. Yes. You know, okay. now you don't know whether the count outside was correct. You know, there are so many variables that could have happened. The time that you started your treatment, you take it as your risk. Okay. But I, I made a generic statement that it's not a function of time, that we've analyzed our data fairly, fairly carefully. If I may ask one more question. Please. Uh, so uh, with regard to the monitoring, so nowadays there is uh, some, uh, uh, once you have treated and the patient is in remission, so how long do you monitor this patient monitor? Yeah, yeah again, for time constraints, I have not put it, but the BCA, BCG uh, blood cancer journal publication, please look at it. It has all our details. Basically for low risk patients, after we do our first monitoring at the end of uh, consolidation one, and we do that only by bone marrow. In the low risk group, after that one, if it's negative, there's no further monitoring. For the intermediate and high risk, if at the end of uh, bone marrow, uh, the first consolidation bone marrow is negative, then we follow them up for once in three months with peripheral blood RT-PCR for two years and stop. Of course, if you're positive in the intermediate risk group of patients, we change the protocol to the high risk. And the high risk patients, if you're positive at the end of induction, we give an additional anthracycline cycle. It's there. It's all, all the details of the protocol are there. You know exactly how we do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sir, uh, arsenic, we are giving weight based uh, uh, dosing. No, sir. So, it should we care less than 25 kilos? We don't give it more than 10 milligrams for anybody uh, more than 25 kilo, more than 45, 40 kilos. I mean, you know, it'll work out to 10 milligrams at about, I think. Uh, 45 kilos. We don't go more than 10 milligrams at all. Okay, sir. So there is a capping to 10 yes. mg. Yes. We never go more than 10 mg. But that has been challenged by the UK group. You must look, you must be aware of that. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Uh, hey, can I, hi, sorry, please. Hello, sir. What are you doing uh, in Bangalore? Sir, I'm in Nagpur, so sorry. Like, okay. I think some, something messed up. So, uh, okay. sir, it's always good to hear from you. Um, I was very interested in this uh, arsenic resistance uh, pattern, which you uh, told us about. Previously, the conventional teaching is that uh, APML is never arsenic resistant. So we continue to give arsenic at relapse also. So I, yes. I was looking up at the data, recent data. So I found a um, letter to editor in the BGH from the Chinese group in the last month. They have uh, shown that uh, the arsenic resistant cells have shown sensitivity to venetoclax. And they have shown a uh, combination of venetoclax in synergy with some low-dose chemotherapy that it works well. So uh, would you be looking at uh, venetoclax in the further studies, like when you combine bortezomib, certainly it gives better treatment options to the patients in relapse setting? It's part of our work that's coming up, and it's exactly along the lines of what I was telling you. 
the relapsed patients, you're basically targeting the mitochondria. So there are different ways to target the mitochondria. Venetoclax is one of them. But I don't believe that uh, APO will not work. And I think all of y'all have treated relapsed patients and uh, they actually behave quite well with ATO, unless you have the A216V mutation, which is extremely rare. In our entire series, we have one patient that's, that's over two decades. So it's very unlikely. That's not a common uh, uh, genotype at all. So yes, so they had nine the patients. Sorry. Can I say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there were nine patients only, but they had documented uh, that A216V or something yeah. resistance like that. If you have the A216V mutation, so that's what I'm saying, both primary resistance to ATO and secondary resistance is very rare, okay? Uh, at a bulk disease level, that means you can get up to MRD negative. It doesn't mean to say you're cured, but up to MRD negative, you can get. That means there is a population that is being missed, you know, and that's what's cause, that's what's causing the relapse and which can be overcome to some extent by the autologous transplant if you look at our relapse data. But in the A216B, you have primary resistance or secondary resistance. If it came back after treatment with ATO and you got an A216B, ATO is not going to work in that patient as well as uh, it would in a patient who does not have that mutation. It may show some effect, but the PMLRAR protein is not going to get degraded by the conventional mechanism. Uh, so, uh, uh, I wanted to ask you about the autologous transplant. Uh, the, how does it work? It, does it work by targeting? I mean, it's it, not targeting, of course. It's, it's, it's stromal cell damage, stromal cell damage, or what? How does it yeah. work? Yeah. It's, it's basically the conventional uh, principle of an autologous transplant. Why do we do an autologous transplant in MRD negative? Basically, you're trying to get an intensity of chemotherapy above the threshold for stem cell recovery, and therefore you're getting a dose intensification that gets rid of last set of malignant cells. Uh, that's, that's the conventional principle. You know, we never you do autologous transplants with disease on board. You have to get MRD negative. So what it is doing is there is a population of, there is a very small population that you can't detect, but the intensity of the autologous transplant is able to overcome. That. That's all we can say at this point in time. So and one more about the challenges in the diagnosis. Yeah, uh, how do you think like certain cases are not fish positive, fish negative APMLs? Um, so, and there are of course other challenges in diagnosis in the country. So, uh, how do you think we should address these challenges? Uh, yeah, so unfortunately, I personally think an APML should not be handled by centers that are not handling large volumes of leukemia. You know, it's uh, because it's it's difficult to get everything in place. You need very good, and there's data to to support that to some extent. So you need fish, you need RT-PCR, all sent simultaneously, preferably with in-house labs that are going to give you rapid turnaround results. You know, I'm talking in our center, we will get it in 24 hours. When you say it's urgent, uh, at least the fish report, we have a stat fish for uh, 1517 that we'll get in less than 24 hours. And the RT-PCR will follow soon if there's a strong suspicion it's negative. And if by chance that negative, they do the 1117. And beyond that, it's going to take time. But in 95 to 96 percent of patients, we will be 96 to 97 percent of patients, we will be able to establish a diagnosis in 24 to 36 hours. Right. So I think we are uh, clo closing in on the time. Uh, is there any final question that we can uh, to Dr. Matthews? Uh, I just wanted to um, um, ask a request to emphasize on the initial therapy as he shortly touched upon it but it is very practically important in our setting when a lot of patients are high risk like they have counts ranging from even 50,000 to 2 lakhs and the general teaching is that as soon as you see an APML patient start on ATRA that is there's no question about it that is truth also but the thing is when you start um, a high risk APML on ATRA upfront the rapidity with uh, which the differentiation comes in Sometimes it's very difficult to handle that in the situation when the patients are already having IC bleed or maybe the lung is not well. So in those situations, um, because this is a different, uh, like in Velour, we follow that pattern. But in this group, if we can um, like guide them. Yeah, so I'm a little hesitant to do that because what we have, what we have proposed is not, uh, is not RCT evidence-based, but it's rational-based. 
So what we do is very important to get the anthracycline on board quickly. In fact, uh, it's often even in a sick patient because the most important thing is to cut the malignant promyelocytes, to cut the coagulopathy, to cut the differentiation, to cut the uh, uh, capillary endothelial damage. So it may seem paradoxical, but even if the guy's got an IC bleed, I would push the ATO and anthracycline very rapidly and really up the, uh, up the supportive care in the first two weeks because all your support is in the first two weeks. We delay the ATRA by seven days or till the counts come to less than 5,000, whichever is earlier. Uh, and that is, uh, uh, again, I require, uh, request the audience to see that publication. I'm not saying that I cannot at this point and say, why do you say that that is the only way to do it? That is certainly not the only way to do it. The RCT does not even talk about it. The APML4 study does not talk about it. But the rationale that we have used is ATO is more apoptosis. ATRA is more differentiation. And in fact, when you use even the ATO ATRA in the low intermediate risk group of patients, you see a proportion of patients who really skyrocket their counts. You know, now in a Western setting, there is very aggressive management of that, you know, with hydroxyurea, supportive care, et cetera. But in our patients, once they go into a kind of a hyperleukocytosis with a differentiation syndrome, you know, hypoxia going to ICU, it translates to morbidity and mortality much more, much higher in our setting than in a Western setting. There are, if there is an infection uh, at presentation, like pneumonia, yeah. so how will you place the... Uh, it, it's a very the... tough one, uh, Sriraj, but I, I personally, in APML, I, I don't compromise. I will give the two doses of microxantrone, I would give the ATO, and I would support as much as possible in the first one week. If he has to go to ICU, he has to get NIV, he has to be intubated, so be it, but it has to be done, because until you cut the coagulopathy, pneumonia actually is the worst thing in APML because their ability to flood their lungs is very rapid when you start therapy. And that's a reality. So I, I'm, you know, the pneumonia patients are the ones I, I most fear in APML. And of course, the renal failure patients, you know, is also a challenge. I'd love to continue and go on with this discussion forever, but uh, Shinto is uh, <laughs> tight on time. So sure. I think we have to stop now. So there's a awesome uh, uh, presentation and a great discussion, sir. Thank you okay, very thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Shinto. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you, sir, for the lucid presentation. Thank you, Neeraj, sir, for moderating and all the panelists.